Masks are the first line of defense against the coronavirus, protecting both the wearers and those around them from infectious aerosols and droplets. But some doubt that masks actually protect against COVID-19. With protests across the globe against restrictions, including right here in Germany, what does the latest research tell us about how the disease is spread? Do masks help prevent new infections? What about social distancing? Is it safe to travel or exercise? Open questions that need answers as we continue to navigate life in the pandemic. Well, a study by Berlin's Charité Hospital has found the risk of catching the coronavirus from contaminated surfaces is lower than thought. That's the good news. The bad news is the risk from droplets and aerosols is greater than previously thought. That means talking, singing, coughing or sneezing can spread the virus. Enclosed spaces with reduced air circulation also pose a risk. Close proximity, indoors, with poor ventilation and physical exertion. These are factors that help encourage infection with SARS-CoV-2. Everything indoors, where there's little fresh air to start with, obviously one has to be very careful about aerosol transfer. This first became apparent through infections in choirs. Cantor Tobias Broman was rehearsing with 80 singers in the rehearsal room of Berlin Cathedral on March the 9th. Their chairs were distributed throughout the 120 square metre room. Five days after the rehearsal, 60 members of the choir were sick. People were infected all over the room. Because droplet infection over such long distances is almost impossible, scientists suspected aerosols were responsible for transmission. Aerosols are tiny particles, like fine dust. Virus particles can attach themselves to the aerosols and spread infection. Scientists are now certain that these are the main infection route indoors. Aerosols occur wherever liquids are finely atomized. This can happen, for example, on people's vocal folds when they're speaking or singing. While larger droplets can't travel far because they fall to the ground, smaller aerosols are lighter and float in the air for several hours indoors, spreading all over. That's why ventilation is so important. Constant ventilation is best. Rooms should be ventilated every 20 minutes, ideally ensuring cross-ventilation. A fan can also convey stale air outside. I'm personally very careful whenever I'm indoors. If there's no fresh air supply, I'm very careful. And if there's something else, like an air conditioner blowing the air around, then I'm especially careful. If the air is circulated like that, then I wouldn't stay in that environment very long. Outside, aerosols are harmless. The tiny particles are diluted so quickly in the fresh air that they're not dangerous because infection requires a certain quantity of viral droplets. Also, ultraviolet light renders the aerosols harmless. The best thing to do is to meet people outside. A quiet family gathering in the countryside is practically the best solution, where you can also observe social distancing. The worst situation is in a closed room with hundreds of people partying for 10 hours, drunk and shouting. That's naturally a horror situation when it comes to the transmission of the novel coronavirus. The Berlin Cathedral Choir has responded to the danger of indoors. Their rehearsals now take place outside the cathedral, much to the delight of passers-by. Well, William Schaffner works in preventive medicine and infectious diseases. Just how infectious is the coronavirus when airborne, according to the latest research? Well, it certainly can be transmitted via the airborne route at some distance. We still think most of the infections are transmitted indoors within six feet, but there's no doubt now those airborne particles can travel more widely 
at a greater distance, particularly if you have someone who is a super spreader and is shedding large amounts of virus. So both close in and farther out contribute to transmission. This is a very contagious virus. Who, who in this case is a super spreader? So someone who's not wearing a mask? Oh, certainly someone who's not wearing a mask. Masks are very effective in, in blocking transmission out. And of course, that's why the recommendation is, here in the United States at least, that all of us should be wearing masks whenever we're around other people. What, what would you say to the guys at my gym who refuse to wear a mask, some of my colleagues even, and people out there who just say they have a right not to wear a mask? Well, it's very difficult to persuade people who are very fixed in their beliefs, but it's not a matter of right. Right depends only on your behavior, but this is a contagious virus. What you do actually affects others. Not wearing a mask, that's like driving your car when the light is red. You endanger others as well as yourself. What about um, something like air conditioning or ventilation uh, systems? I know quite a lot of people are worried about that. The, the famous Berlin Club Berghain has partly reopened with fans installed on the dance floor and in the toilets to prevent the spread of aerosols and allow people to party. But um, how effective are, are measures like that? Well, we think that uh, air conditioning, which brings new air in and gets some air out, and moves air around actually dilutes the virus. So most of us think that air conditioning is beneficial. Uh, it's still a matter of debate. And regular fans? Uh, the, the Salzburg Festival has told classical music lovers, for example, to keep their fans folded and endure the heat, saying fanning could spread infectious aerosols instead of allowing them to be sucked up by the air conditioning. Yeah, you see, there are two ways to look at the fan. First of all, does it spread the virus? Potentially, yes. But does it also dilute the virus? And we think the answer to that is yes. So air movement, akin to what it is outside, most of us think is a good thing. Things will get more difficult in the winter when we have to keep our windows closed. Oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't even got to that yet. I did want to ask you what's going to happen because we're talking about, you know, doing so much outdoors. What happens when winter comes? Well, when winter comes, we're going to have two problems, not only COVID, but influenza. Our old friend will visit us. So here in the United States, we're recommending everyone older than six months of age be vaccinated against influenza. It's not a perfect vaccine, but it still can prevent many influenza infections. Personal protection, that's good. And it will take some of the strain off the healthcare system, the hospitals, emergency rooms, doctor's offices. So we're urging everyone to get vaccinated against flu this year. How worried are you about the second wave that is currently sweeping parts of the world? Yeah, I'm worried about it. Seriously worried. Here in the United States, as everyone knows, we're not doing a good job in controlling this virus. We're still in the first wave and it could get worse this winter. So we need a, a national plan, which is not yet forthcoming. So we're struggling here. COVID well, will be with us. It will not disappear. No, no, it doesn't sound like it at all. William, um, one last question. A, a British study has found singing is no more of a COVID-19 risk than talking. It says volume is the most important risk factor. That's the uh, University of Bristol. The researchers there found that aerosol mass produced rose deeply with an increase in volume of singing or speaking by as much as 20 to 30 percent, or, or 30 times rather. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little dubious about that study. Singing re <laughs> involves more volume. It so does. we will spread the virus more with singing, I think. No, I've, I've never been to a quiet concert, that's for, for sure. <laughs> um, William, looking ahead, is there anything positive you can leave us with? We're working on vaccines. Everybody around the world is working on vaccines. We have vaccines now in final stage clinical trials. We hope, my fingers are crossed, that they will work 
and then we can start distributing this vaccine around the world. My fingers are also crossed. William Schaffner, thank you very much for joining us there from Nashville. Vielen Dank. Derek Williams' turn now to answer your questions on the coronavirus. Our science correspondent has been holed up in his home office since the beginning of the crisis. Can certain pre-existing conditions cause some people to get sicker than others? I was kind of amazed when someone pointed out that I haven't answered this really pretty basic question in the five months I've been doing this, so no time like the present. Um, a range of underlying medical conditions, what are known as, as comorbidities, are associated with more severe outcomes if you contract COVID-19. Um, there's a long list of conditions that, that might be linked to it as well, but the evidence is pretty clear that people are in particular danger who have a chronic heart, respiratory or kidney disease, uh, diabetes, cancer, sickle cell disease, um, as well as patients who are immunocompromised or obese. Um, because many patients have more than one of those comorbidities, it's proven pretty difficult to rank them. But a, a widely accepted study from June estimates that nearly one in five people worldwide is at increased risk due to at least one comorbidity, and, and one in 20 is at high risk. Um, those people in particular should pay close attention to social distancing measures in daily interactions. Um, they should wear face coverings, they should wash their hands often, and not break off their treatment plan without talking to their doctor. Um, and finally, they should continue to get as much safe physical activity as possible.